Had a good meeting. Thank the Lord for it. Uh, turn to the book of Psalms with me. Just kind of anywhere. Just pick your psalm. We ain't going to start there no way. So, uh, we're going to talk about this morning the historical context of Psalms. And there is historical context to these psalms, and some of them's pretty plainly laid out, some of them not so much, but uh, it'll be a help to us. I know Brother D wanted to cut the grass, he was supposed to, but if that's the worst thing happens today is the grass doesn't get cut, it's going to be a good day. Amen. Right. I mean, I ain't making light of, you know, the man, I ain't make, I'm just saying. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, brother Jeff Thomas, how about pray for us? Get us going here, brother. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for life, being in the house this morning, dear Lord. Thank you for having passion in the board back then. This morning's good meeting out there, Lord. Just pray that you'll meet with us here this morning, dear Lord. Pray that you'll uh, touch the Sunday school lesson, Lord. Be yes. there. Help us, Lord, receive your word. That we may go out and live a life of pleasing and honor and be in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Uh, this book of Psalms, it's a devotional book, it's songs, but it's also doctrinal content in it. And, you know, it's easy to kind of take this book, in my mind, it's easy to kind of take this book and just separate that thing out of your Bible like it's not historical. Kind of like these things, like these men that wrote these Psalms, possibly even women that wrote these Psalms, like, they wouldn't live in their life when they wrote it, right? Like so it was in some kind of a trance and wrote this song. But actually, a lot of these songs were written when these people were going through circumstances in their life. They were real people. Uh, Isaiah, we have no problem with him being real. But these psalms, right, it's like it's just some kind of imagined up, dreamed up thing, like a song or something. And, but the fact is, these were real people living real lives, and some of these circumstances that they were in are recorded in the Bible, and we can know it. Mm -hmm. uh, anything to increase our knowledge of the Scriptures is good. Uh, there's, there's power in this Word. It's God's Word. Right. It's God's inspired Word. They're preserved in this English language. It is the Bible. Now, if we can read other things, and, and, you know, and it'll help us. Uh, Sister Allison had the Baptist bread this morning. You like devotion? Get you one of them, man. Uh, I know Brother Ben, he mentioned he likes to read Spurgeon, did a, did a devotion one time. Get you a devotional book. Good stuff. Get you some good devotions, right? Get you some other books. Uh, I'm reading uh, Adoniram Judson about his testimony, his mission, his life. I, I'm reading that again, To the Golden Shore. Very good book. Get you some books, something to help you. But nothing no thing is as valuable as the scriptures. Those books are good and they'll help you and praise God for them. They are not inspired. They are not inspired of God. They might be an inspiration of a man guy and he, and, he, and he pins something down and thank God for it. But nothing is valuable as the scriptures. So we can, when we can look at these scriptures, some of these Psalms, and see the historical context of them. And it tells us, or we can discern, that somewhere else in the Bible, David or Haman or somebody was going through something at this time, and we can look at this psalm and know not just what happened. It kind of, sometimes it gives us more information about the event. But a lot of times it'll tell us what these people's mindset were. Not just what was happening to them physically, but what was going on in their mind. Right? What were they thinking? Because when you read these psalms, we're going to see many times they praising the Lord and shouting, and, and it's kind of like, man, these dudes has got to be in camp meeting. Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody going to work. They're getting fed three meals a day, good singing. You ain't got to do nothing but sit down. That's what it looks like, right? But we're going to see sometimes these men were up to here in trouble. They're writing these psalms praising God. Right. You know what that is? That's contrary. Right. That's contrary to what? That's contrary to your flesh is what it is. Yeah. Right. These situations, these struggles, these trials they were in, how did they handle it? What were their thoughts 
towards God during these tough times. Uh, let's take a look at David. He wrote 70-something of the Psalms that's accredited to him, roughly half of them. Uh, turn to 1 Samuel 22. Let's start there. 1 Samuel 22. We think of him as being King David. There was a large part of his life when he wasn't king anybody. Uh, he was anointed as a young man by Samuel the prophet. And God had him picked out to be king, but he had to go through some things in his life and some events had to transpire before the kingship took place. And you can look at it as a time of training. You can look at it as whatever you want to. Uh, a lot of times young men are called to preach. But the Bible says that a novice shouldn't be a pastor unless the devil get advantage of him, right? Just not saying God hadn't called him to preach, praise God. He's got some growing up and some learning and some trials and tribulations to go through before he's prepared to step out and do things for God. <clears throat> Look at 1 Samuel 22. Look at verse number 1. So in chapter 21, David's running from Saul. Saul's trying to kill him, and he goes up to the Philistines, right? He ain't got no business hanging out in the Philistines, man. So, 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 so they find out who he is. They're about to kill him. We're going to come back and talk about this in a little bit. But, but, but look at chapter 22, verse number 1. <clears throat> it says, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. So we know he had the 30 mighty men, right? But these dudes were discontented and in debt. This wasn't like top flight people, right? Many of them. So pretty much he's got a bunch of rabble hanging out with him. That's his guys, right? And look at verse number three. And David went thence to Mizpah of Moab. So he goes from Philistia to Moab, God's wash pot, Right? And he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with you, till I know what God will do for me. And he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the while that David was in the hole. So here's David. He's running from Saul. Saul trying to kill him. And he goes to one enemy, then he goes to the other enemy. He's got his family. He's got some good guys hanging with him. He got some rabble hanging out with him, and he's just trying to figure out what to do, and he's just pretty much got nowhere to go. Right. Nowhere to call home. Home isn't home anymore. Now, this is the man that's been anointed king of Israel, mm -hmm. and he can't stay in Israel because the current king of Israel is trying to kill him. What's his mindset? What do you think is going through this man's mind? Well... God's anointed me king. Saul better know what he's doing. Right? Saul better watch out. Did he blame God? Well, God, you're the one that anointed me king. Why am I spending all my time in the lands of the enemies with this crowd hanging out with me? I got nowhere to go. What's going on? God, you anointed me king. I didn't ask for it. I was tending the sheep, minding my own business. When Samuel came to anoint the king to Jesse's house, David wasn't even there. They had to go fetch him. Did he blame God? Did he hate Saul? Was he done with Israel? That's fine. You can have Israel. I'll go somewhere else. If it's going to cause me this much, what was his mindset? Some of the Psalms tell us exactly what his mindset was. And we're going to look at it, and we're going to see chances are, if we were in this situation, David's mindset would not be our mindset. Turn to Psalms 34. Psalm 34. So David, he's running, he's hiding in caves. And this isn't one of them movie caves where they got electric lights and Got a whirlpool. You know how they make them places look glad. This ain't one of them. This place is full of stinking bugs and spiders. and You know how we always get a bug in the house. Man, we got called seven exterminators, right? This is, this is the old nasty old caves where he's living. 
Look at Psalm 34. A Psalm of David when he changed his behavior before Ahimelech who drove, who drove him away and he departed. So this Psalm was written... He went to, fit to the Philistines. They drove him out. He's living in the cave, right? He's on the run. That's when this psalm was written. So what's David's mindset? Look at verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now, I don't know about you, but that right there would not have been the first line in my psalm. I'm living in the cave and living with the enemy and I got all this rabble hanging out with me and I'm supposed to be king. I'm supposed to be in the palace chanting 99.9% .9 chance my first line ain't going to be I will bless the Lord at all times. But that was David's mindset. Even during this time, that was his mindset. Look what it says. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. He sure ain't delivering from that cave, has he? So he delivered him from his fears, though. Look what he says. They looked upon him and were light and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. What? You living in the cave, man. You having to act like you're insane so the Philistines won't kill you before you go to the cave in Moab. You know, and, 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 and you read this psalm and the whole psalm reads you. Look at verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. You know what this psalm reads like? This psalm reads like a man living in a palace. That's what it reads like. Not a man with no home. Right. Not a man with no country. If you just read this psalm, you would think, man, this dude, David, he's on top of things. He's in the palace. He's got it covered. And he doesn't. You know what he has? He has nothing but troubles in his life physically. But you know what he's got? He's got God in his heart and on his mind, right. man. You know what that is? That's a good lesson for you and I. Turn to Psalms 57. Let's look at another one. Psalms 57. So we can look at the historical context of these psalms. It'll give us not only more information on some other scriptures, but we can apply this thing spiritually to our life. Look at Psalms 57. It says to the chief musician, uh, and them words right there, I can't hardly see them. Couldn't read them if I could. When he fled from Saul in the cave. So here's David again. He's running from Saul. He's in another cave. David spent half his life in a cave, seemed like. So what's his mindset? Look what it says. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. That man's living in the cave, but you know what he said? He said he's under the shadow of the wings of the Almighty, is what he said. His circumstances are not dictating his mindset. His circumstances are not dictating his belief in God or his praise of God. I will cry unto God most high, to God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the approach of him that would swallow me up. Selah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. Look at verse 5. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. Look at verse 7. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. This man is in a worse strait than you and I, than I have ever been in my life. You know what he's doing? He's glorifying God, man. I, I will stand up and shout. I just will. Sometimes. Chances are one of my deepest 
troubles and sorrows, that's not when my shout comes out. Seems like my shout tends to come out when I'm on a mountaintop, not when I'm down in the valley. You know what? David wasn't like that. You know what the Bible calls David? A man after God's own heart. That's what it calls him. Turn to Psalm 63. Let's look at one more. Psalm 63. Look what it says. A psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Wilderness of Judah. Desert area. Nothing out there, man. Just scorpions and lizards and snakes and no comfortable place when you're in the wilderness of that desert. Look what he says. He says, O oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. He was out there in that old desert and living off the scrub and sleeping on the hard ground. You know what his soul thirsted for? God. God. That's what he's saying. To see thy power and glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Look at verse 8. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand beholdeth me. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speaketh lies shall be stopped. He's in a tight spot on the run living in the wilderness again. You know what he's doing? Just seeking hard after God. You know where we miss it many times? Let me tell you where we miss it many times. We wait until God delivers to praise Him. We, as 21st century American Christians, we are after the fact God praisers. That's what we are. We ought to be praising God before it happens. That's what the book of Romans says, right? Calls things that are not as though they were. This man didn't wait till after he was delivered to praise God. He praised God for the things that he was going to do. And he believed he was going to do for him. Right. You know what it kept him from doing? I had, might have kept him from building him a bridge and jumping it off of it. Won't no bridges out in that wilderness. Might have kept him from being down in the dumps. You know what praising God for things yet to come? It just might have kept him from just giving up and quitting on God. How many times have we given up and quit on God, quit on God on, with things because we got tired of waiting. We got tired of waiting for deliverance. We shouldn't wait until God delivers to praise Him. Turn back to 1 Samuel 21. Let's, let's look at another one. 1 Samuel 21. So here's David again. God's inspired scripture. He's on the run, man. Saul trying to kill him. Look at 1 Samuel 21. Look at verse number 10 with me. 1 Samuel 21 and verse number 10. The Bible says, And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath, Gath was, in, was one of the Philistine towns. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? They recognized him as king of the land, didn't they? And they did not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. So here's David running from Saul, running for his life. You know where he finds himself? In the enemy land surrounded by his enemies. Now, he had killed these Philistines left and right. You hear me? 
Saul wanted a hundred foreskins of the Philistines for a dowry, so this dude went out and got him 200, amen? I mean, he has killed, he is the Philistines. Saul wasn't the Philistines' number one enemy. Saul's sitting around a house drinking himself to death. David was the Philistines' number one enemy, and here he is running from Saul, running for his life, supposed to be king, and he finds himself once again in a tight spot. Tight spot. Old saying is between a rock and a hard place, right? Nowhere to turn, nowhere to go. Did he pull him out? Did he spend all his life complaining about his circumstances? You know, it'd be easy to do. What's today? The 12. You know what it'd be easy to do? 6, 12, 22. It'd be easy to sit around and complain about our circumstances all the time. Well, I ain't got nothing to complain about. You ain't been to the pump. <laughs> Think about a truck driver going to the pump. You ain't been to the grocery store. And it don't half affect you because I ain't nothing on the shelves now, amen? You know what it would be easy to do? It would be easy for us to sit around. Lord, I'm working myself to death. I can't make the ends meet. It would be easy to sit around and complain about our circumstances, wouldn't it? Yeah. wonder what David did. Turn to Psalms 56. Let's see what David did in this circumstance. If you read that scripture, he went on down and they brought him before the king and he acted like he was crazy. Let Spittle come down on his beard and that king said, you going to bring me a crazy man? Get him out of here. That's when he left and went to the cave of Dulem, very next chapter, and wound up in Moab, right? But here he is amongst his enemies, the Philistines. Look at Psalms 56. To the chief musician, upon that word right there again, we're going to get Brother Tim to read that tonight, amen. <laughs> Mitch Tam of David, when the Philistines took him in gas. So here they are. These Philistines brought him to the king and said, Is not this King David who slain his ten thousands? That's this time. Look what he said. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. What time I am afraid, look what he says, I will trust in thee. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my, trust, put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Right. Look on down at, at verse number nine. When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. In God I will praise his word, and the Lord will I praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Look at verse 13. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Will thou not deliver my foot from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? That would have been a perfect opportunity to pull him out and get down in the dumps, wouldn't it? You know what God did, uh, what David did? He just trusted in God, man. Mm -hmm. Praising God. Mm -hmm. The Bible speaks about a renewed mind, about a transformed mind, about a mind being fixed on God. I'm not saying we don't give concern for our circumstances. But you know what? Circumstances change. You know what does not change? The Lord don't change. And we keep our mind and our energy and our focus focused on the thing, the one, the being, the God that cannot change, the God that cannot fail, the God that cannot lie. You know what that's going to do? When we get our mind and our focus and our energy just like David, no matter what the circumstance, no matter how tight the spot is, when we focus on God and just how big he is, you know what it does? It makes puts those circumstances that we have in perspective. 
But when our focus, our mind, our energy, our thoughts are only on our issues and our problems, you know what happened? Them problems get real big, don't they? I don't know what your situation is, but I'll guarantee you it ain't big as God is. You know what David realized? David realized that. He realized just how big as God was. All right. So we know the story in 2 Samuel 11 of David and Bathsheba, right? David just made an absolute flat-footed mess, right? Got another man's wife. We know the circumstances. This historical account, it gives us some facts. Uriah was killed. Her husband. Murdered. The baby that Bathsheba and David had, David had, it died. The Bible says God told him because the baby died because you gave my enemies a chance to blaspheme. We know that the Bible says the sword never departed from David's house again. The Bible says this is the only thing that David disappointed God in. That's what it says. But honestly, when you get through that little bit of time, as bad as it was, it seemed like things kind of just ironed themselves out, didn't it? There's like one chapter devoted to that. <laughs> right? A man had wrote that. We would have wrote devoted 98 chapters to that, right? And run poor David through the ringer and drug him through the mud and beat him up and tripped him and kicked him while he was down. That's what man would have done. That's what we like to do, right? Easy target, man. But you know what? Some of these psalms have to deal with this very instance also. And we get a little more insight into the situation of how it affected David and how sin affects you and I. Turn to Psalms 38. You know what sin has? Sin has physical consequences. It just does. Sin has physical consequences. When we get sin in our life, it will affect us physically. And it may be something like we're going to see here. Look at Psalms 38. Look at verse number 5. David said, this is a psalm of remembrance. That's what the superscription says. Verse 5 says, My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled, I am bowed down greatly, I go mourning all the day long, for my loins are filled with the loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. You know what this sin brought to David? It brought disease to David. It brought physical trouble to David. You know what sin will do to you and I? It will bring physical trouble to us. And that may not be a disease, but you know, somebody that's saved, that's born again, they get caught up in some sin, and they're hiding that thing. You know what it'll do? It will drive you insane. You know what it'll do? It'll put so much stress in your life, it'll make you miserable. The most miserable person in the world is a Christian that's in sin out of the will of God. Not them lost people. They're miserable. They don't know it, though. To the best of their knowledge, that old lost crowd out there living like the devil, they feel like they are yucking it up, man. There's pleasure in sin for a season. But you let somebody that's born again, somebody that knows God get into sin, you know what it'll do? It'll wreck your heart. It'll wreck your life. That's what it'll do. It'll bring physical consequences to you and I. Not only that, turn to Psalms 51. There are physical consequences of sin... But of course, there are spiritual consequences for sin. I heard, uh, I believe it was Adrian Rogers say one time, talking about sin. He said, I still sin all I want to. He said, I just can't enjoy it no more. <laughs> you can do whatever you want to do. God is not going to Pick you up like Ezekiel and whiz you away. You can still do whatever you want to do, but if the Spirit of God is dwelling inside you, man, it just ain't the same no more. 
it just ain't fun no more. I had a friend one time, he smoked, he was trying to quit smoking. So he went to the doctor and they gave him some kind of medicine. And what it done, affected something in the body, it made the cigarette taste awful. Just made it taste like, about to make you throw it, it made it taste so bad. And we were doing something there, he got a cigarette and lit it up and he hit that thing about twice and he threw it down and stomped on it and said, man, can't even smoke a cigarette no more. <laughs> Sins like that. You can still do all you want. You just can't enjoy it anymore. Look at Psalms 51. Look at the superscription. To the chief, chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came in unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Same time period, right? Look at verse 4. Now look at verse number one. The Bible says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. So David's acknowledging his sin to God. But what's going on? Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. If God had to renew a right spirit within this man, guess what? His spirit won't right. That makes sense, right? Look at verse number 11. Uh, Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now you and I know as believers the Holy Spirit cannot be taken from us, right? Just can't happen. And some people say, well, this was hypothetical. No Old Testament saint, if they had something they can lose. It's you and I can't. It's called eternal security. But you know what you can lose? You can lose your fellowship with God. You get sin in your life and your fellowship from God can be wrecked up and you know what you will be as a born again child of God. You will be absolutely miserable. When as a child of God, a child of the king, you ought to have joy and peace in your life. That's what sin will do for you. All right, turn to Psalms 137 with me. Let's look at this. Historical context of these psalms. And we're taking this historical context and it's helping us with other parts of the scripture or it can. And you can apply these things spiritually to our life and it'll help us. Look at Psalms 137. The Bible says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. So where are they? By the rivers of Babylon. This is the period of captivity when Judah was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. And a large part of your Old Testament is devoted to that. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, book of Jeremiah, he was coming against Jerusalem time and time and time again. To the last time, he just broke everything down and took them all away. And they were in captivity for seven, 70 years. Look what it says. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion, Zion's Jerusalem. We hanged our hearts upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they carried us away captive. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of, of its mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. These people were in captivity. You know what they were? Absolutely miserable. They took them harps, they used to sing song and songs and praise God. Well, you know what they did? They just hung them up in the willows, man. Now, when you read the book of Daniel, it's captivity period. Daniel said, and I believe Daniel chapter 9, he was reading the books, and he realized that that 70 years was almost over with. Book of Esther, the book of Ezra, 
the book of Nehemiah, when you read these books, this is this time frame, this period right here. And this is how these people felt in their heart because they were away from home. You know what I do? When you read these scriptures and read some things, I know why they're saying that now. They're in captivity. They're away from the land where God wanted them to be because of their sin and their transgressions and they're miserable. But how do, how do we apply that to us? I ain't going to Babylon. Babylon's in Iraq now. <laughs> you want to be over there, man. That's a bad place. You are of the wrong persuasion to be over there. How does that apply to us? You know what people do sometimes? God's got them in a place, and it's their place, and it's where God wants them. You know what they do? They get to looking, they get dissatisfied, and they get to wandering sometimes. You know where they find themselves? They find themselves away from home, and they find themselves in Babylon. You know what you do if you ain't careful? You get dissatisfied with things. You get dissatisfied with people. And it's the place where God would have you to be. And you're going to make a move and make things better in your life. And you're going to find yourself living inside of Babylon. And all that joy and all that peace and all them songs that you, that you used to sing in your heart and amongst God's people, you're going to find yourself just like these people. Flat out miserable couple more. Turn to Psalm 90. Now this one, Moses wrote this song. And really I pretty much just got this thought. I don't know if it's right or not. But I don't think it's right. Send me an email, amen. <laughs> you don't think it's right, write me a letter. Look at Psalm chapter 90. Now Moses wrote this song. Look at the superscription. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. That'd be a good title, wouldn't it? The man of God. We always call a preacher the man of God. And he is, right? But a lot of men of God, they ain't men of God. Right. <laughs> That's just how it is. Mm -hmm. So look at Psalm chapter 90. Look at verse number 9. It says, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are three score and ten years. That's seventy years. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thy anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts into wisdom. So Moses is saying, man's got seventy years. If it gets 80, you know, well, it's a little bit extra, and it's sorrow, and it's travail, and it's misery. You know what I got to thinking? I got to think about Moses here. And he lived to be 120 years old. Uh, you can go to Acts chapter 7. That's where Stephen is. Before the Pharisees, and he's rehearsing the history of Israel, and he's talking about Moses. And he said, Moses spent 40 years in Egypt. And thank God he forsook that, right? He realized that wasn't right. But he spent 40 years in Egypt. Then in another verse in Acts 7, it said he spent 40 years on the backside of the desert. Mm -hmm. Then we know he led God's people through the wilderness for 40 years. 40 and 40 and 40 is 120 years, right? And he's saying in this psalm here, that if you get 80 years, you know what they are. They sorrow and woe and misery. And I just kind of got to thinking that that first 40 years he was in Egypt, thank God he... Realized that was wrong, but you know what? He wasn't doing much for God there. No. And that second 40 years, I, I've heard it said God had kind of used that for training. There could be something to that, but he was watching the flock on the backside of the desert. He wasn't doing much for God. That first 80 years, I wonder if God ain't trying to tell him that first 80 years of Moses' life wasn't nothing but sorrow and woe and pain, but that last 40 years, you know what he was doing? He was serving God in the will of God. If you are not serving God in some capacity, you are not fulfilling the purpose That's for your right. life. Is everybody's capacity the same? Absolutely not. 
absolutely not. But God has a plan and a purpose for every person to serve him. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in that will for your life, no matter what it is, you are not fulfilling the purpose in your life. One more, we're going to be done. Turn to Exodus 29. This one's kind of interesting to me. Exodus 29. Talking about these Psalms. We can read these Psalms and apply them spiritually to our life and use them devotionally. But you know what? If we read the Psalms for what they are, they can help us understand other portions of the Scripture too. Just give us more understanding of God's words. Look at Exodus 29. <clears throat> Look at verse number 5. And thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with the curious girdle of the ephod. And thou shalt put the mitre upon his head and put the holy crown upon the mitre. Then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. So here is God anointing Aaron to be the high priest. And I don't know. I kind of think about anointing. I think about Benny Hinn or something. You know what I mean? And you see somebody that's got a bottle of anointing oil. And it's, it's a bottle of anointing oil. You can buy them things, man. Buy some anointing oil. It'll help you. Some frankincense or something. You can buy them things on TV. They are killing it, man. Probably Western oil in them bottles, right? That's what I think about anointing. But what it is, is a symbolism. God is setting Aaron apart. He's consecrating Aaron to his service. Just like God calls you and I. He calls you to preach. If he's given you children, you have been called to be a mother. If he's given you children, you have been called to be a father. That's how it works. You got a Sunday school class. You got to meet your help. You work in a nurse. Whatever you do. You cut the grass. You got a ministry, right? God's called you. He still calls today. And he consecrates us, right? Just like he did Aaron here. Well, when he calls us, and we dedicate ourselves to God, how much does he get? Does he get that much? Surely he don't get both arms. I'll give him two arms and a foot. When God calls and, and, and we dedicate ourselves to that purpose, how much does he get? Turn to Psalm 133. Turn to Psalm 133. I'll show you how much Aaron he got. Psalms 133. Verse number one says, Behold how good and how pleasant is it, it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And we hear that verse a lot. Praise God, man, it is. We talk about Aaron being consecrated and you and I being called. How much does God get, right? Look at verse two. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment. Mm -hmm. Moses took that anointing oil and poured it on Aaron and it won't be in a hen bottle. It's not like me, it was a jug, amen. And that thing covered his head and ran down his old long scraggy beard and just covered up his skirts, his garments. You know what it got? It covered all of him. We didn't get that from Exodus 29, did we? We got it from Psalms 133, though, didn't we? And it ties right in with the rest of the Bible. Bible. When God calls us and we accept that call and dedicate our life to God, he don't get part of us. He's supposed to get all of us. Right. So that's just a few. The whole historical context of the Psalms. Hope it was a help to you. Uh, Brother John, how about closing prayer, brother?